Well, I'm going to go ahead and start off the meeting, and I'll just keep letting people enter as they show up. But again, welcome to the PNP Palace Hope Zoom weekly call. We're so excited to have you. Um, we're glad to be here to do what we've been doing since 1998, offering hope, support, and encouragement for, for everybody who's fighting PMP and other cancers of the abdomen. We are super excited today to have special guest, Professor David Morris from University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, to talk to us about the, the Bromac trial. And obviously there's been lots of talk about this trial and lots of excitement. And I think that's partially why we have so many people here today. But as we start that discussion, you know, Professor Morris, I wanted to, to ask you um, for your recollections about our founder, Gabriella Graham, who you know, each of us is um, on the board of PMP Pals. We're here today because of her work and helping make sure that we got to care. But uh, we know that you had interactions with her. So maybe we start by you sharing some of your memories of Gabriella. Well, my memories of Gabriella are certainly very fond. Um, and I think that it's a great example of um, how you can use your energy and enthusiasm and ability to help other people. And she did that. And PMP Pals um, is because of her. And um, I think it's a, a great thing that we have this organization for um, this disease. Um, and yeah, I remember Gabriella well. Yeah, she was a unique individual. She had quite a bit of spit and fire inside of her. So uh, she's a memorable person for sure. So taught us how to do what we do. So we're grateful for her teachings and, and her memory for sure. Well, that's great. Well, we're all interested to hear about the Bromac trial. So what can you tell us about it? Tell us about which patients are eligible and you know how this is going so far. We'd love to hear about this. Thanks. So let me start um, by explaining what Bromac is and what it does. Bromac is a combination of two agents. One is bromelin, which is from the stem of the pineapple plant. and The other is N-acetylcysteine. Both agents are already used in medicine um, for other um, applications. But what we found some years ago, um, which was really quite um, original, was that when you put the two together, it actually dissolved tumor-produced mucin. Um, and that's what we were looking for. And we looked at a lot of other um, compounds before this. And so we can um, fluidize um, mucin um, within a short time. Um, and we have then used that um, in patients with um, pseudomyxoma um, and other mucinous tumors to dissolve the mucin and to be able to remove it from the body. At the moment, the um, study, which will start in the US shortly, will be in patients with inoperable pseudomyxoma. Um, and uh, the contraindications uh, to the use of um, Bromac um, are allergy to either agent, that is pineapple, or to N-acetylcysteine. Um, we uh, don't like people to have coagulation difficulties. Um, that's probably a theoretical uh, risk, but we are excluding people who have uncorrectable coagulation defects. That's pretty much it. Excellent. And so, you know, one question that comes to mind is, you know, how long has the trial been running? I understand in Australia, it's been running for some time now. Yeah, actually, thinking about it, it's been going for about two years. And we've certainly got follow up um, of that order in our first um, um, and we've now treated 34 um, patients. Um, and we published a while ago the first 20. Um, and we described a 80 odd percent um, response rate in those patients. Um, we've also recently looked at the long term outcomes um, in patients. Um, and uh, I guess that knowing which patients respond best um, and 
how often to use it are things that we're still we're still learning. Certainly, yeah. Well, this is this is great. And just as a reminder to the group, again, thank you for registering for the event. It's very helpful for us to stay connected with you. And many times from the the Hope Zoom call, we've been able to connect individuals and physicians, and it's it, that's been one of the most rewarding parts of this. So, so thank you for registering. We do, Professor Morris, have a, a list of questions that people have sent in as well. Sure. And, and team, due to the lot, large size of the group, we have muted the lines. But if you have additional questions that you aren't hearing asked now, feel free to send an email to zoom at pmppals.net, and we will go ahead and collect those and make sure all the questions are being asked. But uh, so, Professor Morris, again, uh, the, the most popular question was, when will this trial be available in the U.S.? Okay. Um, I've been very frustrated and disappointed that we haven't been able to get it um, going already. Um, but we are now very close. We have manufactured um, sufficient quantity of the drug to make it available. We have three um, trial centers at the moment in the U.S. Um, we submitted what's called an IND to the FDA, and the timing of that should allow us to start very soon, um, certainly within the next couple of months. Um, and uh, I don't foresee any other delays, um, but I've been disappointed. Sure. Well, I, I work in uh, FDA registration myself, and I know that can be a, a time-consuming and frustrating and laborious process. So. We, we certainly uh, empathize with your situation. But so this trial also is a trial that has been funded and supported by the ACPMPRF, and so we're glad for their support and partnership in this. And I know they have resources available that could help if, if that's something that would be beneficial. So we'd be happy to help make those connections too, if that would be helpful. So another question that came up was, is this, uh, intraperitoneal uh, attack being used on uh, lamin. So at the moment we're using it in all um, mucinous tumors, um, including um, high-grade tumors. I'd have to say that the lamin um, results are the most dramatic, um, where we have seen um, rapid and easy um, resolution of the highly mucinous deposits. Um, we also um, know from our laboratory and animal research that when we use Bromac with um, a drug called gemcitabine, we see a considerable increase in efficacy of cytobine. And so for the higher grade tumors, we will be uh, pursuing that as a treatment option. I hope that will start um, in Sydney in the next months. Um, the NIH have also um, expressed a real interest in uh, pursuing that trial in the US. So probably they will start concurrently. Um, we certainly have great animal data for high grade um, as, uh, colon cancer, gastric cancer. That's fantastic. This is, it's exciting to hear about these advances and, and what you're seeing with the data and, and the practical successes. So this is really good. I know as, as an engineer who has to deal with moving fluids, you know, mucin can be tough. And we hear our specialists talk about this challenge all the time. It's not something easy to get out. So the ability to, to liquidate something like that and, and move it is, that's great. It's good news. Um, so one question, one of the um, inclusion criteria is that a patient is high risk for repeat surgery. Can you elaborate on what that would mean? Yeah. So um, I'm a surgeon and I um, deal with um, patients with peritoneal cancer um, almost every day of the week. And I think that that's um, one of the important things um, for um, patients with this disease, and that is that you should be treated by experience center. You have some great experience centers in the US, um, and we're going to work with initially three of those 
um, for this trial. Why I'm saying all of that is that who's inoperable depends a great deal on um, the team that are looking after you. And at present, um, we are only advocating this for inoperable um, patients. Um, so patients who are unfit for surgery because they have serious comorbidities um, or um, because their tumor is actually physically unremovable um, are at the moment the patients we um, seek for this trial. Also need to point out though that I think that it's quite likely that this treatment will be used in patients with much earlier disease as a non-invasive, um, easier, safer option than um, current um, operation. And I think that laparoscopic um, removal of tumor together with our um, dissolution is going to be something that we think be interesting. Absolutely. Now that's, that's, you know, and I would say for the benefit of the group, you know, advances in science, this is, how things work, right? We have to prove safety and efficacy first and understand the uh, pharmacodynamics or how the body processes the drugs that are being administered. But once those methodologies and those drugs are approved and understood to be safe, then, then our physicians have the flexibility to use them at any time during the course of disease treatment and recovery. So, um, yeah. so and, and tell me if I've got that right, Professor Morris, but I think this gives us just one more arrow in the quiver, so to speak, that we can use advantageously for, for fighting the disease. I very much hope so. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, another question. So, it, so I, I see that there's two different administration methods. One is a direct injection into tumors as well as a, a general perfusion intraperitoneally. Is, yep. it, is it difficult for that direct injection? Are you finding that to be harder? And are you, what benefits or pros and cons versus those two methods? It's really patients in that some patients have localized pockets of recurrent tumor. And in those patients, a percutaneous approach under a scanner by um, placing um, a small pigtail drain into the collection together with um, the operation of the drug is the appropriate way of doing it. If you've got generalized peritoneal disease, um, then we've given it directly into the peritoneum. So yes, there are two different ways of using it. Good. And so we did have a question come in, and I think this discussion just coincidentally answers that question. Yes, these drugs are being injected and administered carefully into the abdominal cavity. This is not an intravenous treatment, so to speak. It's not going into the veins. It's going directly into the abdomen or injected directly into the tumor itself, which is even a more direct approach. Good. Um, well, there's a question here which um, PMP Pals will render an opinion on, and Professor Morris, I absolutely welcome your your either support or or you know modification of that. But when should someone ask for a second opinion? You know, our experience shows us that patients who are educated and get multiple opinions tend to do better uh, during treatment and recovery. And you know, I've Personally, I'm a 16-year survivor of appendix cancer, and every time I go to a conference with the specialists or I see one of the specialists on my own, I learn yeah. something new. And so, and I think Professor Morris, I think you would say, you always encourage patients to get other opinions as well. Um, but I welcome you. Look, your I think, I, th I really think that this is probably one of the most important um, aspects of patients' care with PMP, and that is you must have the opinion of an experienced center. Um, and uh, uh, of the patients uh, with PMP that I see from America, many of them have been treated by local surgeons with little knowledge or experience of um, treating this disease. And as I've said, you've got great um, centers in the US for looking after this disease, I would always have a second opinion. 
I mean, in, in America in particular, we have access to some of the greatest mm -hmm. um, advances in, in healthcare technology, but it's vital that you ask for it. When you yep. go see a particular specialist, if they're your local hospital, th that is the physician's job to tell you, yeah, I can help and this is what I can do. But it, it's not necessarily true that they have to tell you all of the possible ways that the, the disease can be treated especially if they're not familiar with it. So it's important that you seek out care. Um, far too often, every week we talk to patients who have been treated by local uh, surgeons, uh, Professor Morris, and they've had an hour or two of surgery. And we know that this is an extensive disease that requires detailed um, experience. And uh, a two-hour surgery would be very, very short for, for our disease. I've done one and a half thousand peritonectomies and our average peritonectomy would still take nine hours and some will take 16. Yeah. But uh, and the first operation is probably the most important operation. Indeed. I mean, we've been super pleased to have other uh, HIPEC specialists on these Zoom calls and patients who have felt really confident that their local surgeons had given, you know, Good advice, and it was good advice, but again, we, we always recommend, if you can, get to a specialist, you know? Um, and we know that this, the studies show that, um, you know, physicians who, and centers, right, they should have done 130 to 140 cases to get past the learning curve. So, um, so it's great to see those connections being made and um, yeah, getting people to care, really, yeah. for sure. Chris, could I add something to that? Of course, Charmaine. Well, I just wanted to say from my experience, I had my uh, cytoreduction surgery in HIPIC 11 years ago, and I had had uh, PMP for nine years before that. But um, even beyond just seeking a second opinion from your local surgeon, I would say that if you speak to a specialist and the specialist says you're not a candidate for surgery, I would highly recommend seeking a second opinion because yeah. I started moving from a local doctor in Austin, Texas to a specialist. The first specialist I consulted said I was too far gone. He wouldn't touch me for surgery. He thought I would have a terrible quality of life if I did have surgery. And uh, I sought another opinion, and I had my surgery in HIPIC, and 11 years later, I have no evidence of disease. The surgery was difficult, but no more difficult for me than I think uh, for most patients, really. And, uh, you know, I went to one of the best HIPIC specialists. It was Dr. Sugarbaker. And um, in addition to knowing so much about the disease, he's also a fantastic surgeon. And and got through the surgery. It was hard. I had some adhesions, et cetera, from my previous surgeries. But I just want to stress that even other specialists may say, I really can't do anything to help you. I feel like your case is too complicated. My, my, the surgery will be too hard on you, whatever. And another surgeon may look at it differently. And that was certainly the case for me. Yeah, that's great. We're, we're all very glad to have Charmaine here. She's on the board of directors at PMP Pals. So uh, sometimes the most impactful thing we say is our survival time. And Charmaine, how many years is it for you total? Uh, 22 total 22. since I was di diagnosed. <laughs> I never get tired of hearing that number. I love saying it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's fantastic. So let's see, I have more questions coming in. So this is a good question. This is a, a detailed question here, Professor Morris. Does the patient population for which these drugs are being tested include those with mucin bound in scar tissue with disease that's embedded in the liver or diaphragm, right? So now we're getting to a little bit more technical details here. The answer is it all depends. Um, and if there is a, um, on the scan, a pocket of um, tumor, which is uh, place the brain into, then yes, they are. Um, and um, that may mean that multiple um, needle placements may be um, required, um, but that's eminently possible. 
And one question I have, I know with a lot of the um, immuno drugs that we have now, right, there's a lot of HAMA responses or immune responses. Are you seeing those types of that response from the human body in response to these drugs or are the side effects lower? Well, the side effect profile of Bromac to date has been very good. Um, we do get an inflammatory response. CRP, C-reactive protein, is raised for the first couple of days after administration. But it doesn't make people sick. Most of these treatments are actually done as an outpatient. Um, so it's had a good, good profile so far. That's but good. it's, a, it's a, a, a work in progress. And you know, whilst we've treated 34 patients, that's still early days in the life of a drug. Um, yeah, it looks good. That's great. I, I took herbitoxin, so that was quite a wicked <laughs> response. I had a, the full upper torso response. So um, that's great to hear that the, the side effects aren't too terrible. You know, they're manageable. Good. Um, I think that is all the questions that I'm seeing in here now. And so Back to what's that? Back to the sheep. <laughs> back to the sheep. I'm, I'm on my farm. I'm having the weekend off that and was, going back to the sheep. So back to the sheep. Yep. I was going to ask what was on the agenda at the farm today. Thank you so much. Well, um, and I did want to take a moment and remind folks, um, you know, PMG Pals has been here offering support again since 1998. And we have a number of programs that you know, I, I personally took advantage of, and I would encourage you to take advantage of as well. Our most popular program is our, our Get Well Cards program. And uh, this is just a couple of the cards that I personally received. I've got a whole box that I keep very close to me and I see every day. Also, um, the Bear Bottom Bear program where you can get a, a bear made for you. My surgery was on Flag Day in the U.S. And so you can see that, uh, you know, that's when I received mine. And and as you're starting your journey, we're happy to provide the starter kit for you, right? So there's different things you're going to need, including hand sanitizer, a good notebook to take notes with your physician, um, and some other things as well. So send us an email at info at pmppals.net, and we're, we're happy to um, send those things to you and send cards your way for your particular situation. James, I, I see you looking to say something. Yeah, so be, yeah, there's some more questions. <laughs> yes, just people are raising their hands. Chris, do want, want to ask questions? Let's see. I have to page through and see everybody. So oh, I got another question coming in here at Zoom. Ah, good question. Good question. Um, can the Bromac be used on lung mets? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, we have one American um, patient, a young man who had pleural disease from pseudomyxoma because pseudomyxoma does tend to spread through the diaphragm and involve the chest. Uh, he had a good response. Um, we've also treated one guy in the chest who had hard tumor. And that um, wasn't anything like as it. So the answer is again, yes, but it depends. Now this is pleural cavity or lung? This mat? is pleural cavity. Lung mets, no. Yep. Not at the moment. Not at the moment. Yeah. So yep, so I'll, I'll just remind the group if you can email the questions into Zoom. Oh, here they come. Now they get, here they are. Perfect. Let's see. Does Bromac reduce adhesion risk? Good question. Well, I, I haven't worked on that, but there is a good paper showing that it can do, yes. And uh, the important sort of use of Bromac at the time of surgery to increase the effect of HIPEC or EPIC is something which we will work on. Um, and knowing that it reduces adhesions is a good thing. On the other hand, that makes me concerned that it may affect an asthmatic feeling. And we, before we use it in that setting, we need to show in animals that using it in the presence of bowel and asthmosis doesn't affect 
both in astomosi. So it's a work in progress. It is happening. Um, I'll, I'll know soon. That's great. Very good. Um, so let's talk about the situation in Europe. Um, and so part of the question is, can, can the Bromac be used during deep bulking? And I think the answer to that question is not, not yet, but I'll, I'll let you respond to that. Okay, well, it's a very attractive idea in that in parts of the um, site of reduction where you simply can't remove the disease, for example, sometimes we get beaten by the surface of the small bowel and that we just can't get it all off. Treating that area with Bromac um, during an operation is clearly attractive. Will we do that? Yes. Have we done it? Well, we've done a bit. We've certainly um, treated one patient in that way. We've certainly, in the laboratory, looked at solving pseudomyxoma off bowel. And yes, it can be used there. Uh, but again, before we're able to advocate its use, um, we need more. Um, safety and efficacy evidence. But yeah, it's a good question and, and we've thought about it. It's good. And I, you know, and uh, Professor Morris, I'll, I will humbly ask your opinion on this. Do you, do you think we as patients, is it okay for us to ask for our surgical oncologists, our, our high-pec specialists to perhaps consider trying some of these things on a case-by-case -case basis? I, I don't know what your thoughts are there. You know, I think that the peritonectomy community in the world um, is a very interactive one. And certainly, um, when we've been talking about Bromac, there's been a lot of interest. And so, I don't think there's going to be much um, of a problem in sort of disseminating the knowledge and the use of it when it's appropriate. Yep. And so, are there any countries where these drugs are approved for use or like it, it, it's still under clinical trial everywhere? It's... It, under clinical trial, both agents are approved for other uses. Bromac is used for burns, for debriding um, third degree burns, and n cysteine is widely used as an antidote to paracetamol overdose. So both of them are registered drugs. It's just that um, they haven't been used together, and, um, um, and they certainly haven't been used for this disease. Very good. Okay, good to know. Um, how about non-mucinous appendix tumors? Um, invasive adenocarcinoma, would this be appropriate for that? Yes. So what we found was that when we grow um, adenocarcinomas in the laboratory, the um, sensitivity of those cells to chemotherapy is profoundly improved by bromelin. And that's because all adenocarcinomas do have a degree of mucin in their cell wall or intracellular. And when you dissolve that mucin, um, your ability to then destroy those cells with um, germcytobine is, is improved. So we're certainly working on that. We hope to have a clinical trial addressing that in Sydney um, Brilliant. Okay. Very well. So how about um, oral bromelin? So we have supplements. Um, what are your thoughts there? Yep. I, I think it's very difficult to get enough bromelin um, into the area um, where the problem is uh, by oral administration. And um, I, I, I don't think it can be done, to be frank. Um, we also are interested in whether we're able to administer intravenous um, bromelin or bromac. Um, and at the moment, I can't say that we are able to do that. I think there will be some safety issues around that, but we're working on those in that we do have ways of um, making the bromelin more available to tumors after a venous administration so that you don't get systemic side effects. So oral, I can't see it at the moment. Uh, I don't, that's likely. Very good. Um, 
So the question here, so when should we begin inquiring with our oncologist? Um, I'm not sure which country this is from, but so, I mean, perhaps the, you know, it's not too early to start discussions, but again, I think it's going to be a case by case basis and obviously limited by when each country, you know, approves the, the use, you know, the, 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 permits the trial to begin. Yep. So Eindhoven in the Netherlands and Lyon in France are going to be two European centers, which hopefully will open at a similar time to the American ones. Good. So it, UK and Europe, I'm, there's a couple questions there. So Eindhoven and Lyon, are those the only two centers in Europe? At, at present, yes. Are, are you seeing interest from the specialists in, in other centers there as well? Yes, um, but we're a, I'm an academic surgeon and we formed a small biotech company around uh, this uh, drug in order to be able to develop it. And we have limited resources to kind of uh, open lots of centers at the same time. Although we're giving the drug free for the uh, trials, we still do have costs of compliance. Um, so uh, we can only do a certain number of places at one time. Sure. Yep. And and how about the the, the number of patients in the trial? Right? Does that is that number expandable, or is it, you know one hundred? So, yeah. So we've been told by the FDA that they'd like a hundred patients in the trial. But it, it's also possible for people to be treated off-label. Um, and so um, once the IND is in place and trials are in place, it is, it is possible for patients to be basis. Okay, very good. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, is Bromac available under compassionate use? for patients who have exhausted all options in the United States. I'm not, you know, I don't know. I'm not. I'm yeah, not I think, I think that means I go to jail, right? Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't yeah. think I can answer it, that question. It's pretty much like that in that I can't actually supply. I have very, this week agreed to supply um, drug to a physician in Taiwan because he has, um, uh, exhausted all other options and um, will be treated in a center on a named patient basis and they are dealing with the legalities in that country. Um, but in the US, until we have the IND in place, um, we cannot do that. But I, I don't think that's a problem in that it, the IND really, it's a matter of a week or so. Um, and so I don't think that um, there is really any um, time problem with supply, at least in the U.S. Very well. So um, that is all the questions that I see so far. If there's a couple more, I'll, I'll wait till we send them in. But I'll take a moment and pause while we're, we're looking for those last questions to, to again reinforce, you know, I, I've been going to the the, the conferences personally, as well as the rest of the PALS team for over 15 years now. And we're very lucky to have um, geniuses of this degree who are working on our disease, truly. Um, some of the most intelligent men and women that I've ever known in my life. So very grateful for that. And it's innovations and science like this and and navigating these very difficult regulatory processes um, to get these advances to us. So we're very grateful. And um, I can see why there's a, a lot of uh, excitement about- Hey, that's a, load, that, that's a load of crap. I've just got a good time. <laughs> well, you're on the farm. You know how to deal with crap. So that's <laughs> good. Well, this has been incredibly informative. Um, we're about 40 minutes past the hour now. Adele or Michael? Is uh, there... I think there is another question or two. Okay. Still others coming in. Um, I, I think, well, we hit the refresh button one more time. Ah, 
Is it a one-time procedure? I'll let you talk to no. that, Professor Morris. No, um, it, it's not a one-time procedure. In that usually in a patient with high volume disease, we would do a few treatments at the initial um, treatment, deal with the areas that are the most problem, and then um, A, um, deal with other lesions uh, over um, months, um, but all as an outpatient. Um, and in terms of retreatment, yes, retreatment is possible, and we have experience of that. This is really fantastic, really, really interesting. Um, well, you know, the whole point of these calls and, and what we do at PV Pals is to give patients hope. And, you know, again, we find that educated patients are, are patients that tend to, to do better and have more success. So we're very grateful for the innovations and in bringing the science to us. Um, and, and thank you for your time. Another question comes in. Who are the lead investigators at Eindhoven and Lyon? Okay, so I'm absolutely dreadful at names. So my, 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 uh, I'm about to um, fail. It's Ignace de Hingi in um, Eindhoven. And in Lyon, um, it's dreadful, I can't remember his name, he is my friend. Um, and in fact, one of his surgeons is with us um, at present in Sydney. If anybody wants names, just, um, email me and we'll send them um and um yeah i'm sorry it's gone that's okay hold on i see now no it doesn't list the name at the sites and so folks i am looking at clinicaltrials.gov right now and you can enter the disease of pseudomyxoma peritonei and the other term of bromelain and then you'll find the trial here. And it does list the sites, but not the principal investigators at each site. So our apologies for that. Um, Dr. I'm sorry, Professor Morris's email is also listed here at clinicaltrials.gov and it's david.morris at unsw.edu dot au and it's olivier glihan my memory kicked in <laughs> that's great well folks usually we have the opportunity to to have higher touch and um, engagement with one another this has been a particularly well attended event um, with lots of folks and so today is just slightly different format. Uh, next week we're going to be celebrating um, Cancer Survivors Day and we'll be back to our regular um, high touch environment so we'll be looking forward to that. We can all support one another but Professor Morris thank you so much for for sharing this information with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi. We may have one, one more question, one more question. <laughs> at the last minute, but I echo the comments from a patient perspective. This just gives us great hope, uh, the, the advances that are continually being made and, and the opportunities that, that we have as patients today as compared to years ago. Um, so Roz is asking, can you be in this trial if you don't have mucinous tumors? Um, I, I, I think the answer of Professor Morris is, no, 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 they must be mucinous tumors. Okay. Well, good. All right, then with that, I will. Any more questions coming in? No. Well, good. Well, thank you so much again, everyone for taking the time on the weekend to be here and especially Professor Morris. Thanks again, and make it a great day, everybody. And if you have questions, you can email them to zoom at pnppals.net, and we'll be happy to follow up um, in any way we can. Thanks so much, and take care. Bye. 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 Thank you.